So welcome all of you to our reproducibility seminar. Today, it's my pleasure to introduce Caitlin Hare to you. She's a postdoc from the University of Edinburgh from the group uh, which is called Camrades. And the Camrades group is, and Caitlin herself, is doing meta research. That means research on research. So how to improve research to get better results. And she's talking about preclinical science and yeah, in pre-kinetic sites, we really had a reproducibility crisis, and I'm really looking forward to her talk, how to improve reproducibility in preclinical research and how to yeah, introduce more open science into preclinical research. So please, Caitlin, the stage is yours. Thank you, Claudia. I'll just share my screen. Here we go. Great, so hopefully you can all see that. Um, and yeah, I'm no longer muted, so you can hear me as well. Uh, so it's really great to be here today. I'd just like to thank the reproducibility team for the invitation to come and speak to you all. A bit of an introduction to me. So as Claudia mentioned, I'm a postdoctoral researcher working with the Camradies group at the University of Edinburgh in the UK. And our goal is really to try and improve the validity, the value and the translation of preclinical research, that is research in animal and cell based models of human diseases into uh, the human condition. So we really want to make it make it better and more valuable so that we can actually treat human patients with um, the, the interventions that we test in animals, for example. And we do this by conducting meta research. And we use techniques such as systematic reviews and meta-analyses to really synthesize all of the evidence from the animal and cell-based models. We also uh, develop guidance for me like new methodologies in systematic review and meta-analysis of animal data because it's usually been applied to clinical data. It's much more common in that space to perform meta-analyses and systematic reviews. We also develop automation tools to try and help us synthesize all of this evidence because it's very time consuming to do this sort of work manually. And finally, we're also interested in um, creating projects to try out new interventions to improve research. So sort of research improvement activities as well to try and uh, make, make research better, basically. So in this talk, what I want to discuss are some of the problems that preclinical research faces, uh, including the reproducibility crisis, and I'll go into a bit more detail on that. Then I'll talk about open research practices and how these can help, hopefully, improve the situation in preclinical research. And finally, I'll talk a little bit about how we can change things for the better and a little bit on some of the work we've done in that space. So first of all, I wanted to start with a really dramatic example of probably the worst case scenario uh, in this in this area, which is academic fraud. And obviously, this is this is off the scale. This is the worst case situation, but it's of real interest to me because my sort of research area of interest within meta research is dementia and Alzheimer's disease. And you probably know, even if you're not in that area, that there's a lot of research in that space especially in animal models. There's been so much research over the last few decades and lots of new discoveries and things going on. And this was a recent investigation that came out in the journal Science and it made headlines across the world because it was reporting signs of fabrication in important articles in the preclinical Alzheimer's literature surrounding a protein called amyloid beta 56. And this protein is thought to be really important in cognitive decline. Uh, both in sort of the it was shown in sort of animal models and then they tried to validate it in, in human patients as well. Um, a lot of this research had been done by one researcher, Sylvian Lesney, and essentially there was an investigation to look back at his articles in detail and they found that there was evidence of fabrication in his images. So these were things like Western blots, microscopy, and other images from his work. And keep in mind, there've been decades of work built on this topic, and it sort of contributed to a major theory of how Alzheimer's disease uh, develops in the brain. So it was quite a big deal. Um, at the moment, it's still kind of 
unclear if it definitely was a fabrication because essentially the authors of these papers are refusing to share the original data behind the Western blots and behind all of the, the figures in the paper. So it's hard to know for sure that this, this is problematic, but it's an example of really the worst outcome of irreproducible or not open research methodologies and the problems that we face as a field. And it's interesting because when I came across this example, you start thinking about, well, why would someone do this? Why would a scientist commit fraud in the first place? Because science is all is meant to be about understanding nature and, you know, finding out new new things and helping humanity. But sometimes these days it feels more about getting your paper into nature. So things have switched a little bit and there are some issues with research culture and incentives that I just want to touch on. Um, this is really not just for preclinical research. This is kind of across across the board, but I think it's it's a particular problem in, in the preclinical space from my perspective. Um, and scientists are really rewarded for publishing, particularly in high impact journals. And they're also rewarded for obtaining grant funding. Um, of course, the vast majority of scientists don't commit fraud, absolutely not. Um, but it's worth noting that the author of those papers, Sylvia Lesney, as soon as he found this big result about amyloid beta 56, his career really skyrocketed from that point and he got grants and fellowships and tenure kind of based on those papers because they were so exciting at the time. So it's, it, you know, it's important to acknowledge and that these pressures can incentivize questionable research practices, even if that's unconsciously. So yeah, it's important to just acknowledge the reward system that we're in, uh, first of all, in all of this. And something that we're really interested in uh, within Camaradis is that a lot of this research has been conducted, so there's lots of papers being published, but actually quite often the results from those papers in preclinical models don't translate into the results that we'd like to see in human patients. And again, because I'm interested in Alzheimer's disease, I, this is just an example slide of all the many, many headlines over the years about clinical trial failures in Alzheimer's disease. And since the millennium, over 400 clinical trials have failed in a really short space of time. And most of these were based on really exciting evidence from preclinical models showing that a certain treatment was, was very effective, but then it wasn't effective in humans. There's lots of reasons for this, but I'm going to just talk about some of the, the things that we're interested in in particular. So we're interested in using systematic reviews to then go back to the preclinical literature and say, OK, so why, why are things failing when we bring these drugs into clinical trials? If we examine the preclinical literature in a bit more detail, maybe we can start to see patterns and start to look at the data and understand what factors might be influencing the results that we see. And something that we're particularly interested in is controlling for risks of bias. So this was a systematic review conducted quite a few years ago now, and it was looking at the stroke literature, so animal models of stroke. It's just across 11 publications, so it's not the biggest uh, of our systematic reviews, but it was interesting. It was looking at a specific drug that had been taken forward into clinical trial. And what we found is when we divided up the data into studies that had randomized animals to experimental groups uh, and hadn't randomized them or hadn't reported randomizing them and split up the data into studies that had reported blinding and hadn't reported blinding, you can see here, this is an estimate of the, the overall effect size of those studies. And you can see the studies that didn't take these measures to reduce the risk of bias had much higher estimates of effect. So in other words, the treatment seemed to work much better in those studies than the studies that had control for these things. So it might be playing into why things maybe seem to work in the, in the animal models and don't work in, in the human condition. And we know from looking across the literature and doing lots of systematic reviews that the reporting of measures like this, unfortunately, remains quite poor. Things have improved a bit, but um, in general, articles don't tend to report these things as much as they should. Another important factor to consider is publication bias. So this is when articles that maybe have a negative finding or a null finding essentially don't find anything really exciting or don't show that a new treatment actually works are more likely to either not be published or they remain unpublished for a very long time. 
And really it's because there's just less incentive to publish those articles at the moment. Um, there's also issues with selective analyses where if we don't know what researchers intended to do at the very beginning of their study, there might be multiple analyses run and then perhaps the one that gets a, you know, a significance less, P less than 0 0.05, that could be the one that ends up in the paper. It's technically fine to do multiple analyses, but I think the key here is transparency. And if you're only selectively reporting one analysis, it can make it seem like the evidence is stronger than it actually is. There's also an issue with selective outcome reporting where maybe there were many behavioral tests conducted or many different outcomes measured, but only the ones that really show a dramatic difference make it into the paper. And what, what that means is that maybe researchers in another lab in another country are doing the same experiment. They don't know that an experiment has already been conducted because it's never been, you know, that data is not out there. So it kind of leads to research waste as well because people end up doing the same thing. And yeah, the problem sort of escalates from there. And I wanted to just point out this study here. This was a study by uh, Emily Senna. And this was, again, a meta-analysis in the stroke literature. And she identified that publication bias was really contributing to this overestimation of efficacy in stroke uh, preclinical studies. So this is, this is a plot that you can do when you, uh, when you do meta-analyses. It's called trim and fill. And essentially, the red dots here are all the estimated missing studies uh, that are not published. So she estimated 16% of experiments remain unpublished. And that the, over, the overall efficacy of treatments was reduced from 32% to 26%. But she always um, states here that she thinks this is an underestimation of the problem. And actually, the effect is probably much higher than this. So how big is the problem? This is, again, a bit more general, not specific to preclinical research. But there was a recent anonymized survey of research practices at Dutch universities. And it was found that 8% of researchers admitted to falsifying or fabricating data, at least once between the last, the last few years. That seems quite shocking to me. I hope that this is an overestimation. Um, and 51% engaged in questionable research practices. And by that, I mean things like not submitting valid negative studies for publication, um, not including the study flaws and the write-up, inadequate note-taking, judging manuscripts or grants unfairly based on who the authors were, inadequate research designs. And they sort of looked into the reasons behind why researchers felt maybe pressure to do these sort of things. And the key reason that came out was publication pressure. So it kind of relates back to uh, what I was talking about at the beginning. So really, all of this has contributed to a reproducibility crisis. And we see this not just in preclinical research or bio, biosciences research, but we see it sort of across the board in different disciplines. But it's sort of, these are just um, a collection of uh, headlines illustrating that. And I think, you know, what's became clear is that most researchers actually now acknowledge there is a problem uh, and that there is a, a, they've had issues replicating other people's work. This is just another illustration of this. So, um, Recently, the Reproducibility Project in Cancer Biology it set out to replicate all of these really high impact studies in cancer biology. In the end, it actually had to dial down its efforts because it was just so difficult to actually reproduce the studies, to actually find out in enough detail how the original studies were conducted in order to replicate them. And so they had to scale it back a bit, but the headline was that half of them actually failed to reproduce which isn't really a great surprise. But what really struck me actually was that only 2% of experiments had open data, 70% of experiments, they actually had to go out to the authors and ask for key reagents that were used in the studies. Um, none of the protocols were described in enough detail for them to pick it up and, and do the study in their own labs and replicate it. 32% did not 32% of the authors of those original experiments did not engage with this and, and wouldn't sort of help out the reproducibility project to, re to reproduce the results, which is a bit of a concern. So they just never replied or, or were not helpful. 
And yeah, I think it just struck me how difficult it actually is to even test if something is reproducible uh, in this field. So irreproducible research can mean that there's slowed scientific progress because we can't really, we can't build on what's already been done unless we kind of know it to be true and validate it and check it. So it sort of, it, it prevents us moving forward. There's also an issue with translational failure from bench to bedside. There's time and money wasted in this process, especially if, you know, researchers are in one lab conducting the same study as what, you know, another group have done already, but not published it. There, there's lots of issues here with research waste. The public also loses trust in scientific findings, especially when, you know, articles like the, uh, that, that um, investigation into fabrication come out. That's, a, that's of a big concern to people when they see things like that. And ultimately, it can lead to talented early career researchers becoming disillusioned with the process, you know, not, not getting the rewards they, they deserve for, for doing good work and only getting rewards for exciting new results. And they might, you know, become disillusioned and leave academia. So all of this is quite bleak, but this is kind of um, some of the the more worrisome points in preclinical research at the moment and the issues that re irreproducible research can cause. So I'm going to move on to talk a bit more about open science now and how that could be used as at least a partial solution to some of the problems and make things a bit better. And um, I'm sure most of you know what open science is already, but just as an overview, it's a movement to make scientific research and dissemination open to all. And it can, can encompass the whole life cycle of a research project. So it can be, you know, right from the very beginning and the planning stages to opening up your methods and your code, your data, making sure your publications are open access, that your peer reviews are open and that you're open to collaboration and uh, open to a wider audience as well to, un to, um, to understand your work. So ideally in the preclinical space, we would benefit from open science tools that help us facilitate clarity in how studies were actually performed. You know, we need en enough detail to actually be able to, to take that study and replicate it in our own, in a different lab or in a different setting or even just to understand it in enough detail to use in a in a systematic review, to be honest, because I find a lot of the time when I'm reading articles, I'm struggling to really get uh, enough information on how, how it was conducted. Um, it would also help us to have tools to facilitate collaboration. Um, it is important to validate findings and, you know, we want, we really do want the same group of animals and the same drug to be tested in one lab and tested in another lab and then those results compared because then we can have more certainty in our results rather than you know relying on the results of any one study we want those findings to generalize beyond that we also want confirmation that studies report what they set out to do so we want to limit things like reporting biases we want people to say at the start you know this is what i set out to do in my study these are the outcomes i'm going to measure it would be good if we could actually see that somewhere um, so that we know that certain outcomes haven't been removed or, you know, certain, uh, you know, they've been selective about what's been reported in the publication. And finally, it would be useful to have access to data that can be used and compared efficiently. Um, data sharing is still very low in this field, I would say. And um, from my perspective as a systematic reviewer is quite challenging as well because it means that you have to spend a lot of time working out what people you know what the numbers are and the figures and things like that because the data isn't just there for us to pick up and synthesize which is is a challenge and it's not you know if someone else did a study elsewhere they couldn't just pick up the data and combine it to to, to get a more accurate result at the moment. Um, oh, and finally, just on that data sharing point, it also means that it's much harder to check if things are real or true or, you know, detect any errors as well. So you can make your workflow more open by doing lots of different things that I won't have time to go into all of them. But I just wanted to point out this open signs rainbow. And um, if you want to have a look at this, I can share uh, the slides after if, if you want to have a look at this at this link and go through all of the different tools that come in at different stages of the process. 
from the beginning, you know, you can share grant proposals right at the very beginning of a research project through to, you know, how you how you share the results of that project and how you disseminate that to a wider audience, maybe outside of academia as well. So I want to touch on a couple of things that I think are probably the most important. So first of all, sharing your, your plans. And to do that, you can pre-register your study. So this is before you would start uh, an animal experiment, for example. You, you could pre-register your study on the Open Science Framework or preclinicaltrials.eu, or there's also the Animal Study Registry uh, from the German Federal Institute of Risk Assessment. So there's a number of different repositories set up to do this. I'd say the uptake, again, at the moment is quite low. Um, but what this means is that right from the beginning of your study, there's more credibility and transparency in what you set out to do and the analysis that you're going to conduct. And it just really limits the things that I was talking about earlier in terms of reporting biases and selective outcome reporting. Um, it's important to note that journals also uh, more recently have started accepting pre-registrations or some of them accept protocols and things like that now. So if you want to get some more credit for the work that you're doing as well, you could um, turn it into a publication. It probably does depend on the type of study you're doing. Um, it, I, you know, it probably makes more sense at the moment for confirmatory hypothesis testing experimental research, but it doesn't mean that you can't pre-register something that's a bit more exploratory. You just have to be quite open in, in what you're, you know, the way that you describe it and explain that um, you might try a number of different things. Uh, just sort of expanding on from that, you've probably already heard of registered reports. And this is a kind of another pre-registration format, but it's really trying to target this issue of publication bias and the fact that only, you know, exciting studies get published. And how it works is you essentially submit a protocol to a journal that accepts registered reports. Then when they will send it out for peer review. So you get peer review before you've collected any data. And it means you can make any changes to your analysis that's suggested and you can get lots of feedback at that stage, which is really good for the final, the final outcome. Once you've got that in principle acceptance after peer review, you can then collect your data, analyze it, and then write up the final report and the results. And then at that point, the journal has basically committed to publish that final result whether it's a negative or null result or whether it's a really, you know, significant, exciting result. So it kind of takes away that risk of when you get your final results, you know, it's, it's not something that you maybe wanted it to be, um, which is good. And it kind of takes away the emphasis of trying to make a lovely story once you have your results to actually just saying, this is what we set out to do and these were the results. And, that, and that's it. So that's quite a new publication format, but it's really taken off in the last few years. And just to illustrate the impact of this, um, a recent study was looking at the percentage of null findings in registered reports. And perhaps not surprisingly, uh, compared to the traditional literature, the percentage of null findings in registered reports is way higher, um, which is interesting. Um, so there's a lot more negative or, or null findings in, in those studies because they, they get published anyway and it's not affected by that. So it's reducing the reporting biases and the publication biases while increasing credibility and transparency of your work right from the very beginning. Another aspect I wanted to touch on was sharing your methodology. So there's a lot of different uh, tools out there to help you do this. I wanted to highlight protocols.io. So this is a good uh, online tool to use if you have a very long methodology that maybe wouldn't fit into a publication because sometimes there's word limits or you know other restrictions that, that mean you can't really go into enough detail for someone else to, to replicate your study. So in that case you can put it on protocols.io and then you can refer to it uh, using a link so you can refer back to it in the publication. There's also initiatives to, um, to tag resources and one of them is the resource identification initiative. So this is basically a database of all of the different resources that we tend to use in across, across research. This isn't just preclinical. Um, so things like reagents, antibodies, 
um, mouse lines, cell lines, all of that. Most of them will have an RRID number. And it means that when you're referring to that in your publication, you can use the identifier number as well. And it just really helps people work out what you actually use, because we all know probably there's many different ways to refer to the same thing. So it really just helps um, to be more transparent about what exactly you used. Also just wanted to mention, you know, things like electronic lab notebooks. You know, it is really important to try and document as you're going through what your methodology was. And using something that's on a computer um, that's electronic, it's just easier when it comes to trying to share all of that later with the wider community for them to understand what you did and for you as well, because it means it's not stuck in, a, in an old lab notebook somewhere and you can't understand your own handwriting or, you know, it's just it just keeps it all <laughs> a bit uh, simpler when it when you're thinking about sharing later on. Um, I also just wanted to point out the Equator Network. So this is a, it's a network and it's a platform that really has a lot of different guidelines across health research. Um, and it can help you make sure when you're writing up your publication that you've went into enough detail on all the aspects of your methodology. For preclinical research, probably the most important guideline guidelines are the ARRIVE guidelines. Um, Animals in Research Reporting Guidelines. I can't actually remember what the acronym stands for, but essentially they're things that you should report in animal experiments. And all of this uh, contributes to improved transparency and helps others reproduce or replicate your work. Also wants to touch on sharing your data. Again, lots of repositories to do this. So there's Figshare, Open Science Frameworks, and Odo. Obviously, when it comes to sharing your data, there's a lot of um, when an article is going to be published, sometimes there's just a random Excel sheet attached or somewhere. And, you know, an Excel sheet or a CSV by itself doesn't really tell us anything. And it's really hard to reuse that and um, someone else's data without context. So you should ideally provide as much sort of metadata or information about that as possible, including a data dictionary and just a bit more detail on what that data is whether it's raw data, process data, you know, is that your final results or is that a few steps before? And if possible, it's, it's important to try and share your methods as well of like how you got from that raw data to that final process data file. So yeah, not just an undocumented data dump, but enough that someone else could actually understand it. And um, Really, this should adhere to the FAIR principle. So data should be findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. And there's lots of online resources about how to do that effectively. Um, and this will facilitate others to reuse. It allows for more collaboration as well. And importantly, sharing your data it can lead to more error detection, which I know is a bit frightening for people sometimes. Um, I wanted to share a sort of positive story about all this because I think something that from talking to people in this space people are really worried about sharing their data in case people find mistakes and um, which is understandable but I think it would be nice if we were more open to mistakes and accept that they happen and that you know we're all still human and we're going to make mistakes and we shouldn't criticize people for them especially if they've been really open and transparent throughout their workflow so this is an example article I really recommend um, having a read of it if you are worried about that sort of thing. Uh, Julia Strand, she's a researcher in psychology and she realized that she had essentially made quite a big mistake after she'd published quite a big article. Essentially, she realized that she'd unintentionally programmed like a timer to begin before a certain stimuli was presented. So it was kind of recording all this extra time that shouldn't have been recorded. Uh, which was not good. Uh, but in this scenario, she had pre-registered her analysis. She'd shared all of her data. All of her code was online. All of her materials were on the open science framework. And she was just, you know, it had a really transparent workflow. And basically she discovered the problem because she was looking back into her own code for something. She realized it. she reported it to the journal. Essentially, in the end, she was able to um, to put in a revised version of the article and she got that published and I think there was just no question of this being any 
sort of intentional error because she was so open about it and really it didn't affect her career negatively at all because she got a grant, she got tenure. Basically, she's fine. <laughs> so the the moral of this story is just that I think there's less risk of mistakes being really problematic and really damaging if you are really open about your whole methodology. It kind of avoids any disaster later on. And because she documented it so well, she could also easily go back and understand where she went wrong, which is which is good. Uh, finally, sharing your results. Um, just moving on to that. Obviously, we all know it can take a while to get your results out there in a publication. So in the meantime, you could submit them as a preprint to things like BioArchive or MedArchive. Uh, it allows you to get your work out there really quickly. And then hopefully, at some point, you will get it accepted in an open access journal, which means it's then open for everyone to read in an ideal situation. Um, and just this is just an example of um, how preprint servers can actually also be beneficial for you. And I've experienced this myself as well, in that if you submit a preprint, quite often, you know, I find that I get a few citations on an article before it's even been published. And then Google Scholar sort of merges them together. So that's quite smart. So it's, you know, really, you're just getting more attention to your work straight away. Um, and you can also get some community feedback straight away. You might have people emailing you. And um, also in terms of career advancement, um, you can put it, you know, on your CV straight away as an output, even though it's not peer reviewed yet, it's, it's in progress clearly. And people might be engaging with it already, which is good. Um, so yeah, I wanted to sort of end the open science aspect of this talk on how being an early adopter of these sort of things, in my opinion, is actually also beneficial for you. And I think people maybe don't talk about that enough, but you know, obviously not everyone is implementing these practices yet, especially in preclinical research. I feel it's quite, you know, we're a little bit behind other disciplines like psychology, for example, but you know, opening up your workflow, having open data, trying to get reproducible results and open access publications and, you know, getting preprints out there quickly. All of this really does lead to increased awareness and accessibility of your work, allows others to reuse your work and your workflows and your code. And, you know, it also increases your discoverability to the, to the wider field. And it can lead to more citations of your work, your code and your data. So remember, not, not all of your, you know, it's also an output to, to have a data set online and for people to use that. That is increasingly being recognised as well. So it may not always be um, journal article citations, but it could be that people are using your work in other ways. And you may also find that you get more recognition and more opportunities for collaboration as well. Um, I mean, I feel like that's been the case for myself, but I think um, there's just not as much discussion on how all of this stuff can be beneficial career-wise as well, and increasingly so. So finally, I just want to say that adopting all these research practices can be quite daunting, and it's not always easy in every case, and it, you know, it depends what environment you're in as well. All of that plays into it. And becoming an open researcher isn't all or nothing. And certain aspects of research might require some data to be to be hidden away, especially if you're working with any clinical data, for example. Um, so it's really trying to be as open as necessary, but as uh, open as possible, but as closed as necessary. Um, so I'm going to just talk briefly about um, how we can try and make things a bit better. So, because I'm, you know, we're talking about all this at an individual level, what you can do as a researcher, but you know, to change the tide, the whole sort of field needs to shift a bit in this direction. And that is that is largely what has been happening. So there's been lots of new initiatives at different levels. So funders have started unveiling open access policies. Um, publishers have started unveiling things like negative results prizes and trying to encourage people to submit registered reports, for example and to also try to detect any fraudulent images and things like that. There's a few efforts ongoing to try and detect things like that automatically. 
and also at institutions they're trying to think more about how you know promotion must assess these things it shouldn't just be about the number of outputs it should be about the the quality of that work as well and how transparent and open that researcher is um, and how reproducible their work is so things are happening at lots of different levels um i mentioned at the start that camaradis are also interested in research improvement so you know we we know that stakeholders like journals and publishers funders they in general there is a desire to increase the usefulness of the research that they're associated with they want research to be better but it's important to try and understand whether an intervention can actually work at a journal or a publisher and also whether it will actually lead to any meaningful improvements in research quality or reduce research waste in any way so i just wanted to briefly um talk about a study that we did a few years ago that looked at an impact of an intervention to improve compliance with the ARRIVE guidelines. So this was called Icarus, which is quite funny. <laughs> if you know the legend of Icarus, then it aligns with the results of this study. Um, so basically, I mentioned the ARRIVE guidelines earlier. They're the sort of main reporting guidelines for animal research. So we worked in collaboration with PLOS One to conduct a randomised controlled trial. So the studies that were submitted to PLOS One were basically randomised into an intervention group and a normal handling group. In the intervention group, the authors were asked by PLOS One to submit a completed ARRIVE checklist along with their, their article. We then looked at the studies that had eventually been, you know, they passed through peer review and had been accepted. And then we reviewed the studies in both of the groups. And we did this um, in a crowd-based approach we trained a team of reviewers to essentially go through the articles and compare them to the ARRIVE guidelines um, and, you know, compare what, what um, compare the ARRIVE guidelines to what had been reported in the study. So the ARRIVE guidelines are a 20 item checklist, but really when you operationalize it and dig deeper into it, it's 101 individual items because it's things like the animal, the sex of the animal, the weight of the animal. <laughs> Um, the strain of the animal, there's there's a lot within one item. Uh, so we operationalized it. We got a team to review all these articles. Each article was screened by two independent reviewers and then a third reviewer reconciled the answers there. So just a rundown of our numbers. So we had around 850 randomized into each group at the very beginning. After peer review, it was around 650, and there was 340 in the control group at the end and 332 in the intervention group. And of that, 301 out of 332 actually submitted the checklist. So some authors just ignored that instruction. And 13 out of 340 submitted a checklist of their own volition. They just, they just did it, even though they weren't asked to do it. So... Our primary outcome was looking at compliance with the ARRIVE guidelines. And what we found there was that in either group, none of them had full compliance with the ARRIVE guidelines. There's a lot of, uh, there was a lot in the ARRIVE guidelines. So this wasn't a huge surprise. Uh, the median compliance was 36.8% in the control group and 39.5% in the intervention group. So there wasn't a big difference at all, no significant difference. And this radar plot is looking at each of the individual sub items. And what we found was that actually only on a couple of the, the sub items, there was a very, you know, there was a small difference in compliance. And it was the ones that were looking at husbandry measures for the animals. So the housing conditions that they were kept in, that was the only difference between the groups. So really we showed that this intervention, so asking authors to complete a checklist or uh, an arrived checklist did not improve reporting at PLOS One. So the impact of this, the positive impact was that it had a, um, it, ha it fed into the revision of the ARRIVE guidelines. So the ARRIVE guidelines 2.0, along with other things, this was one of the things that um, impacted that. And they've now reduced the guidelines to an essential set of 10 and tried to provide more guidance to authors to help them complete the checklist and actually include this information in their studies. So key messages uh, today for my talk are that preclinical researchers are in a highly competitive academic environment. 
uh, as as we all know, and that's the case across across a number of fields as well. Publication bias, a lack of transparency, and poor experimental designs can all compromise reproducibility and translation. There's lots of initiatives and solutions out there. Being an early adopter of these is beneficial for science, but it's also beneficial for you. And widespread change requires targeted interventions, probably at multiple levels of the scientific life cycle and probably with multiple stakeholders as well. And it's important to try and evaluate the impact of those interventions to see, you know, to prioritise what we should do next and how we can make things better. Um, so, yeah, that's it. That's my last slide. I'd just like to thank the rest of the Camaradi's team in Edinburgh and elsewhere and all of the funders that have made our work possible.